Uh, hello again, everybody. It's uh, Stuart Crawford here with another podcast looking at various aspects of defence and security around the world. I'm delighted to be joined today by Philip Ingram, uh, also uh, an ex-military in individual and a journalist, commentator and pundit uh, and a security and um, intelligence expert. Uh, Philip, welcome to the podcast. Great to see you. And maybe you could give us a couple of sentences on your background and, and what you're up to these days. Yeah, so as a pundit, do I now have to take up crisp adverts um, <laughs> is, is the next question. Um, no, um, Philip Ingram, I am uh, was uh, 26 years uh, uh, an army officer in the British military, most of my career as an intelligence officer, um, uh, and I left as a full colonel. Um, during my time, I spent a lot of it uh, as, a, as a planner, as a NATO planner, so planning NATO's um, joint defensive posture against potential threats from Russia and elsewhere along its northern flank, its eastern flank, and its southern flank. So whenever one guard's tank army attacked into Ukraine, I was very familiar with their tactics and uh, their capabilities. And that launched me into, um, as you mentioned, the, the punditry, where I'm a global commentator on defence and security issues. Most of my journalism is around uh, wider security, counterterrorism, cyber, and and other things across the globe. So you'll see me on telly, you'll hear me on the radio, um, and you'll see me in print in uh, um, publications, as I said, um, all over the world. But um, I think 2023, in retrospect, was a bit of an odd year in that uh, many people, and myself included, uh, with uh, regard to, first of all, Ukraine, expected that Ukrainian... Uh, counter-offensive in the Ukrainian efforts against Russia would have been more successful than perhaps they have been. And secondly, I thought we might have a quick look at uh, Gaza uh, and the ferocity of the Hamas attack on October the 7th, and indeed the ferocity of the Israeli um, response. But really, I mean, um, really, I'm just sort of shooting the breeze there and just wondering whether you have the same sort of perceptions of, of, of the year past. I, I think those are the two major um, things that, that have happened. I think Ukraine, Russia is interesting um, and you know, will come on to Gaza, but you're the one person that's winning out of um, the Israel Gaza war is Vladimir Putin because he's not in the front page headlines now and um, you know, is not occupying a lot of political discussion in different capitals around the world. Um, and I think he should be because um, you know, he's very much engaged still in Ukraine and there could be links and we can discuss that potentially later. But um, your 2023, um, the second year of um, uh, Russia's attack into uh, Ukraine, it's reinvasion. Um, and you know, I'm, what I'm seeing is a lot of the commentary that's coming out is suggesting Ukra the Ukrainian counteroffensive has stalled or failed because the front line hasn't moved hugely. And I think that's the wrong way of analysing it, um, because that's a very one dimensional look at um, uh, where the, 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 the war is going. And you know, I'm probably guilty of hoping that that would the front line would have moved much more like you um, in early days, looking at what happened in Kharkiv and Kherson the year beforehand, where um, the Ukrainians took massive chunks of territory back. But that was without asking the question on what is different. And the thing that is different is that we have the Suvarikan defensive lines that were built. And those defensive lines of anti-tank ditches, mines, um, tank traps with, uh, covered by direct fire and indirect fire are more comprehensive than anything we've ever seen in any conflict ever before. And I'll include the Second World War in that. And we have to recognise that the Ukrainians have not been given the wherewithal. And we're probably not ready to receive the wherewithal from the West to properly attack in. So what the Ukrainians have done is they've very successfully fixed the Russians. They are attriting them um, quite severely in a number of different areas. And they fixed them over a 600 kilometer plus long front line, which means the Russians haven't got the ability to properly concentrate their reserve forces anywhere and, and to, to get into position where they could punch through with mass. And that's really quite clever. You know, the Ukrainians, if you know, if if we were to approach the sort of um, uh, battle into the defensive positions, the closest we came to was during the Gulf War, and we had over a month of aerial bombing across Saddam Hussein's defences before we then put any ground troops in. 
The Ukrainians haven't got the wherewithal to do that. They they haven't got the ability to generate local air superiority, never mind the airframes, um, to be able to drop the amount of ordnance that would be needed to try and um, yeah. uh, damage the defensive lines in a way to then allow them to punch through if they could generate the armored forces yeah. there. I mean, I mean, basically, for the, I mean, my my perception is, and and you may agree or disagree, is that uh, in many ways, NATO countries and perhaps NATO militaries uh, expected uh, the Ukrainians to be able to do what no NATO country could have yeah. achieved without overwhelming air superiority, yeah. and that is, as you say, break through three um, pretty impressive uh, defensive lines at least. Um, uh, which the Russians have constructed. And the whole thing to me was a little bit reminiscent of uh, the Battle of Kursk in 1943. Yeah. Slightly different circumstances, but again, the Russians had constructed these massive defensive lines and the Germans just couldn't get through them. Yeah. So I think we were just being slightly silly and naive, or certainly I was thinking that the Ukrainians would be able to do that. Plus, of course, the important aspect of the training aspect, which you touched upon, in that they don't have yet the training at the sufficient level of manoeuvre you know, above battalion to be able to do a proper combined arms um, operations, yep. uh, which breaking those lines necessitate. And I know from my time in BAOR in Germany, and you'll know as well, that, that building up to that sort of operation takes years of planning and rehearsals and, and dry runs and daytime rehearsals and nighttime rehearsals. And even then, with nobody firing at us, people still cocked it up. So it's hardly surprising that progress has been less than we imagined. Yeah, and, and at the same time, the Ukrainians are completely re-equipping with um, Western equipment that um, changes their doctrine. You know, you look at you look at the main battle tank. The the Russian Soviet style main battle tanks have got a, a, a crew of three. The Western main battle tanks have got a crew of four. You're changing the dynamics inside the tank. If you change the dynamics inside the tank, you change the dynamics within the small formations that we're we'll fighting through, and you change the dynamics inside the large formations. So whilst uh, engaged in um, a, a contact battle. Um, Re-equipping, rearming, retraining, changing your tactics, um, changing your doctrine, and all the rest of it at the same time. I think what the uh, and, and not having the wherewithal to properly carry out a combined arms operation, um, the Ukrainians have actually taken the initiative and brought some things back in um, that we had forgotten and are doing it exceptionally well. Yeah. And for them not to get pushed back whilst they're doing all of that. I don't think there's any Western nation could do it, could do what nope. Ukraine is doing. I, th I think there are a huge number of lessons that uh, Western nations like the, the Brits and, the, and the, the US and European allies will be taking from this, saying, uh, you know, the, the, I mean, the doctrine I was brought up, as you probably were, the doctrine of manoeuvre warfare, yeah. where huge armoured formations swept across the North General, uh, German plain and, and disrupted the enemy far in the rear and all that sort of stuff. And of course, uh, the Ukrainians have been unable to do that for the reasons that we've just discussed. And so um, NATO and West uh, nations may well have to sit back and say, well, hang on a minute. Was this a realistic aspiration yeah. uh, that we had in the first place? But um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it develops. How, how about uh, just moving on, uh, Philip, to looking at well, the, the, the whole... Before, before we move on, there's, yeah, yeah. there's one point I want to say where the Ukrainians are having some some massive success, and I think the, the, this will this will build up on it, is in what we classically would have called the deep battle, um, but it but it's at the operational level. Um, and you know, we see this wall of defence at the front line, um, and we, we are trying to work out whether the success and whether that wall moves Ukrainian way or, or um, to, to get Ukrainian occupied territory back again. But what the Ukrainians are doing is they're hollowing it out from behind. Um, they're hollowing the foundations out by attacking the Russian logistics centres, the command and control centres. Um, they have um, virtually disabled the Black Sea fleet. Yeah, yeah, I was going to make that and point. The Navy. Um, and they've made it impossible for the Russians to uh, operate with impunity from within the lands that they captured. They've done that throughout 2023 and will exploit that, I think, through the winter of, of 2024. And that is significant. And they've started to set the conditions to potentially take the fight into Russia itself uh, in the run up to um, the Russian presidential elections and all the rest of it. Again, that is significant. And we can't, it's, it's very difficult to measure the effectiveness of the, this this deep battle but the brought in tactics that we only saw before with the special operations executive during the second world war we see russian factories suddenly bursting into flames we yeah. see aircraft in different airfields across russia bursting into flames and we um you know we we see railway 
convoys that are so vital to the Russian um, logistics support being derailed because of because of uh, commando operations. And we have to remember that the head of the Ukrainian military intelligence, um, the GUR, is General Badanov. And Badanov is uh, a, a relatively young general, but he's a commando of a background. And we're seeing good old commando tactics and SOE tactics having massive success. And this is something that I think will influence where things are going to go in 2024. Yep. I mean, small bands of determined men and all that sort of stuff that, that Churchill used to talk about. Interestingly, I, I was speculating with some the other day about the potential, uh, which you've just alluded to, of uh, the Ukrainian, the big left hook through Russia and down behind. Um, I don't think they're ready for that yet. I don't think they've no, got they're the not. kit. No, they're not. They've got, got the kit for it. Um, very interesting. Uh, uh, thanks for your thoughts there, Philip. Um, very briefly, uh, just looking at Gaza, and, uh, yes. the, uh, and the and the and the well, it's not it's not a conflict; it's a war. There isn't it really? Uh, following on from the Hamas attacks of the seventh of October, um, and my, my my perception is that the, that the Israelis, for whatever reason, were complacent and uh, and semi asleep, uh, yeah. not being able to notice this happening. Uh, that Hamas was uh, surprised at their own success, actually, and that success in itself has brought upon. Uh, you know, the wrath of the, the Israeli government and the, the IDF in a way that Hamas would probably not have calculated for. And that we, we see basically that Gaza, if not quite being bombed back into the Stone Age, as the Americans once infamously said, is certainly being being rubbleized uh, for most of yeah. it to the detriment of the population. And, and uh, you know, I have nothing but sympathy for the civilian population. But um, I don't think it's over yet. And I don't think that the Israelis will rest until every Hamas operative that they can identify is eliminated one way or the other. And it could take months, it could take years. I, I agree with you completely. Um, what I find interesting was the ferocity and the and uh, the, the length of planning that there had been for the um, Hamas attack into Israel. You know, Israel got into groupthink um, from their military intelligence or their, their wider intelligence perspective um, when it came to the Gaza-Israeli border and the threats coming out of Gaza. They were focused too much on the northern border with Hezbollah. Um, they were focused on uh, issues that were going on inside the West Bank. Um, and they took their eyes off what was going on inside Gaza. And it, it's quite clear that Hamas... Um, could see how the Israelis were gathering their intelligence and were feeding the Israelis what they wanted to hear. Um, and that meant that uh, the Israelis got into a group think of intelligence that, you know, yes, we, we hear th that they're, they're, they're planning something, this is going to happen, but it doesn't fit with everything else that we're hearing and doesn't fit with what we want to hear. And that was that in itself is an intelligence failure. That's the, the, cl the classic cognitive dissonance. Don't Correct. give me that information because that's Correct. not the way we think it's going to go. No, no. If you know, th what, what, what isn't clear out of this is what Hamas wanted to achieve. And if Hamas just wanted to poke the Israeli bear to get an excessive response. They didn't need to spend over a year planning it. They didn't need to come in from the air, from the sea, um, and and cause the the, the level of atrocities that, that they wanted to. So there's there's clearly something else in there that we're not aware of. And you know, my suspicion, uh, and it you know it, it's only a suspicion at the moment, uh, pending more information coming in, is it's the wider Iranian link that we keep hearing about, and and that that potential link between um, Hamas, Hezbollah, um, Iranian-backed uh, groups operating in Syria and Iraq, and of course you know the the Yemenis, and and there's there's a wider piece that could be put in there. And if I wanted to take my thinking in that and put it into the Machiavellian sort of level, I then start to question as to why Iran has is getting an increased amount of Chinese weaponry and North Korean weaponry and link it into the North Korean weaponry yeah. that's coming into I mean, Russia. And the, the winner out of this is Vladimir Putin. Um, so, you know, it's, you know, that, that that's something that we can we can look at as we look forward into what's happening in 2024. Okay.